Imagine having the most wide-ranging news, analysis, and opinion on North Korea at your fingertips. Sounds great, right? Well, it's possible with NK News. They publish a truly diverse selection of unique articles every business day and provide you with valuable newsletters and alerts. Opinion writers and journalists include regular podcast guests like Andre Lankov, Jongmin Kim, Chad O'Carroll, Colin Zwerko, Niels Weisenzer, Peter Ward, and Shreyas Reddy. And because I know you'll love the product as much as I do, here's something special for you. Use the code PODCAST to get a $100 discount on your subscription. Redeem this podcast-only special today by visiting nknews.org slash discount. That's nknews.org slash discount. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for NK News today and get ahead of the headlines on North Korea. And welcome to the NK News podcast, listeners. Today, we, uh, we are recording on Tuesday, the 27th of June. This is the week that we remember the start of the Korean War 73 years ago. And I'm joined here in the studio for an informal chat by my good friend and colleague, Colin Zwerker. Colin, welcome. Hello. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. So as I mentioned, yeah, uh, this is the week that we think about the war starting. Uh, and we have a, a long interview coming up afterwards with a person who lived through the war, Dr. Kim. And of course, right now we're watching a hot war going on in Europe in between Russia and Ukraine, somewhat analogous, some people say, to the Korean War and that Russia is trying to reunify greater Russia by bringing Ukraine back into the fold. Did you watch any of the news over the weekend? I did, probably just as confusingly as everyone else. I got to say, I was gripped. I was glued to uh, you know the, the BBC website, constantly updating, and, and CNN and, and Al Jazeera, just trying to make sense of this apparent uprising, coup, mutiny, call it what you will, yeah. by the leader of the, the Wagner group, Sergei Prigozhin. I may have got his first name wrong, but Prigozhin, I think, is, his right, is the right Can name. Can Yevgeny, maybe? Yevgeny Prigozhin, I think you're right, yes. What a, um, I'm not going to say the, 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 the first part, but what a crap show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hard to follow, hard to understand. Even, even the analysts are saying, the professionals on this topic are saying it's hard to understand what's going on. So, yeah. The, the one thing, yeah, that's true, exactly. I mean, some people are saying, was it all a show? Was it pre-arranged? How was it that after, you know, less than 48 hours after starting a mutiny was the leader of Wagner suddenly convinced, encouraged, persuaded, bribed, whatever, uh, to turn around and, and head to Belarus, where he'll probably be living the rest of his life. I would stay away from any uh, upper floor windows if I was him for a while. But the interesting question is, well, the, the one area of agreement that I do see across the board is this makes Putin look weaker. And that brings us to North Korea. I mean, if you're Kim Jong-un in North Korea, you'd be watching this and thinking about your own position, I think. Sure. Well, I think Kim Jong-un might be looking at it and thinking, maybe scoffing a bit and being like, well, glad we don't have those issues. Because I don't think that Kim Jong-un has, he's not set up anyone with that sort of independent power base and that system does not allow that. So yeah, I've seen this brought up a bunch. I think we ran a piece also just kind of putting it into context mm -hmm. and with the conclusion of being, you know, Kim Jong-un doesn't have this type of situation to worry about. So that's one thing. I think I've, I've also read some other takes on this, which are more about the relationship with Russia. Mm. So trade has picked up with Russia again in the last few months. There was a border crossing over their slim shared border yep. that has picked up an activity in the last couple of months. Are people or goods? Goods. Okay. Uh, no information about people yet. Yeah. Um, some people have of course, left North Korea over that border in the last couple of years. Right. But, well, for one, Russia is not North Korea's top partner in terms of importance. I think that would be China, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, Russia's a distant number, number two. two. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think the implications, which I don't have enough information to be able to, to say what the outcome will be, but, of course, there's been the reports in recent months, and the U.S. has asserted very strongly without really clear evidence that North Korea has been selling weapons to the to the Wagner Group right. to Russia ah. to Russia or with some people saying that that's the Wagner Group and I'm sorry I don't remember if the U.S. said it was directly to Wagner Group or not but people right. have people have said that right yeah yeah and and we know that I mean well, we we believe that the whole war so far as it's gone has been a, a disincentive to 
to Kim Jong-un to try any military adventurism, just as it's been a disincentive to China to try the same thing with, uh, with Taiwan, right? It's, uh, there's no encouragement that they can gain from that. Yeah, and, well, he, he has to take just his own particular circumstances into account if he's thinking about a, a military action. And so North Korea has gotten away with small military actions in the past, which have turned into, you know, have resulted in consequences for him. But no, I mean, an invasion, I think that's off the table no matter, no matter what, no matter what, if Russia was successful or not in its invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. Now, what, one thing that some people have talked to me about is that if you were Kim Jong-un, you could be, could rest reasonably assured compared to Russia that North Korea has, has kept the ideological education of its subjects going consistently over seven decades. And that is something that has been really effective in just keeping people in place, right? That Russia, despite having a narrative, uh, a nationalist narrative that is uh, kind of fueling the war, we can see the fractures uh, as we have over the weekend. But that's something that North Korea doesn't have to worry too much about because it's been constantly uh, drumming home this message of ideological uniformity. I mean, they, they don't call it a monolithic leadership ideology for nothing, do they? Yeah, I mean, if we're comparing systems, obviously, there is a lot of overlap in terms of, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of North Koreans who are true believers in, in the the national narrative. And just like there are a lot of Russians, even I just discovered one of my professors, uh, Beyonce from, from like five or six years ago is, a, is a supporting the invasion of Ukraine. So, Boy. Uh, so I mean, anyone can, can buy the national narrative and it's the same in, in North Korea. But obviously there's people in North Korea who are unhappy with the system. But, you know, this is all, I don't know if this is here nor there because, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, Kim Jong-un is not learning anything about an invasion from this situation. I think the Wagner Group situation over the weekend is more more relevant in terms of what, you know, maybe if this affects North Korea's weapons sales. I saw, uh, I think it was Korea Times or something come out, which is a little bit hasty, I think, in terms of uh, conclusions. But, of course, you have to wonder, is North Korea, does North Korea have a customer anymore? Is the Ministry of Defense the customer? Was Wagner Group the customer? Um, if these weapon sales are in fact happening, so yeah. And I'd still like to know, you know, more specifics about these weapon sales. I mean, were they producing new things and selling them, or is this old stock that they were selling? You know, uh, this uh, old, maybe not Soviet era, but Soviet compatible stuff that they've had lying around since the eighties or nineties. I think there's been no, in, there's been no suggestion that North Korea is selling any of its newer weapon systems to right. to Russia. I, and I think the implication was. Because people are watching for proof of this in the battlefield, like some kind of box discovered in a in an abandoned right. uh, post or or evidence of shells. Shells, yeah, casings. But, but I think the implication from the beginning was some kind of uh, you know, uh, replenishing stocks, the backup stocks that Russia would need, right. not necessarily going straight to the battlefield. Okay, well, yeah, that's certainly something to keep uh, an eye on in the future. Uh, another story that's really been um, occupying my mental space for the last week has been this big story on the BBC about stories of starvation and food shortages in North Korea leading to actual death and even an indirect report of cannibalism, which always you know, uh, gets people's attention. But there's been some questions around how widespread that is, right? Yes, and I think you're mixing a few stories there. Yeah. So I'm not sure... Well, not mixing, but combining. Yeah, I'm not sure if the BBC story had people talking about cannibalism, did they? No, in, the, that, in the Korean... Uh, is that the, something else? The Korean BBC text story... Oh, it did. Uh, ...said um, we, there were rumors of, or there were indirect reports of uh, people hearing about cannibalism, but nothing direct, nobody saying, I, I saw this, or let alone, you know, I participated in this. Sure, I think, I think just we have to be proper news readers when we read these stories so it's not about jumping to conclusions and it's i mean obviously if there's three sources and the way that this information was obtained by the bbc was essentially through just a single person working in seoul that's the only verifiable source of the information as far as bbc is concerned is one man working at the daily and k in seoul he has assured, reassured BBC that the, the information that he has received from North Koreans, which is, is not indirect, it's not from direct conversations from people in North Korea, but rather, I guess, I think that I think that BBC revealed this, that it's bits and pieces of questions in text form mm -hmm. sent separately over time yeah. to someone else, a third party who then sends it to Seoul, mm -hmm. who then gives it to BBC. So that's just a separate issue in terms of the, the attribution, the sourcing. And then you can start to think about how true it is or not. So if we know that that's how they did it, then you have to just take it like most of these unverifiable stories in context. If there's no image, if there's no recording, if there's nothing that you can say is proof, then you just have to take it 
with a grain of salt and, and file it with all the other information. So if there are trends about hunger and food shortages in North Korea, which there are, which North Korea has admitted, then you say, okay, I'm pretty sure it's not just confined to people in maybe rural areas, but, uh, and, I, and someone else made this point, you know, Pyongyang is full of these very uh, sort of slum neighborhoods that are gigantic and crowded. And you have to imagine that people aren't just living perfect, nice lives there. And there are also semi-rural parts in, in the outskirts sure, of sure. Pyongyang too, right? So I just take this all to think, yes, North Korea says there are food issues. They admit this. You know, North Korea is not planting information about problems to send to Daily and K and then to, to BBC. So if this negative information is coming out, you either have to suspect, is, is the sourcing perfect coming through Daily and K? Or maybe this does line up with the trends that we've been seeing. Um, but the details, I don't know. Did you see the written interview that we did uh, with uh, the Russian ambassador, Matsugora, on, on this issue? I did. Yeah. What did you think of that? I mean, he was very, uh, I mean, ob as we talked about earlier, Russia, of course, is a uh, good friend to North Korea. And so uh, it was a message very much trying to refute the BBC story saying that, no, actually, the food situation was worse in 2021, but it's okay now, was kind of the takeaway that I got from it. Yeah. So Matsugora, Alexander Matsugora, he's the ambassador to North Korea from Russia. He's been living there for, I think, seven plus years now. And this is not his first time, right? He has a, he served not as ambassador, but as, yeah. a, as a junior diplomat. Actually, he said in the interview uh, back in the arduous March period, so he's, he was there in the mid-90s, so he saw... Yeah, he was there in the 70s, I'm pretty sure. I mean, oh, he's, he's been in North Korea for a long time, okay. not, not constantly, but he's been ambassador yeah. for seven years straight, mm -hmm. and he hasn't left North Korea since 2019. January 2020, oh, okay, 2019. Some, sometime in 2019, I yeah. guess. Um, so, yes, for one thing, he's a supporter of North Korea in a way, because they're allies, but he... Over the course of the pandemic, for example, he's not been like a cheerleader for North Korea at every point. So he's written a lot of posts that have a sort of a sort of implied criticism of yep. North Korea in, in some certain ways, mostly when it affects them, yeah, just say, just their lives in yeah, yeah. Pyongyang on, under uh, COVID restrictions. Like but, recently when they had to send out 21 more diplomats, since, you know, we can't get any more people in and kind of right. grumble, grumble. So there was a lot of that. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's not like everything he says is, is just a, a pure echoing of North Korean state media. But right. yeah, I... I think that he's probably speaking the truth in terms of what he's seeing on the ground in Pyongyang. I don't think he's going into all these less well-off areas of the capital. Again, it's not like his statement refutes all the talk about dire situations. It's just another data point. And so... Well, let me ask you this, because you, you do a lot of... Um, you have a, a better eye than I do, and you do a lot of uh, analysis of, uh, of satellite photographs. Is there anything that you'd be looking for in satellite photographs that, to show that something was amiss in terms of food supply or people dying on the streets or something like that? That's really hard to get at in satellite imagery, especially with the daily sort of medium resolution, which mm -hmm. you cannot see details such as the make of cars or let alone people. High resolution satellite imagery, some of the, the best you can see the outlines of people and stuff. And I guess you could hypothetically see bodies on the streets, but... It's not like something, well, okay, so we haven't seen anything like that in North Korea through yeah. satellite imagery. Really, the only thing that we were, I mean, I'm sure there are more methods out there. I'm not the, I don't have a handle on all the ideas and methods, but one thing we were doing during the pandemic was we could prove or disprove reports ab about lockdowns. So you could, you could get a high resolution image of Pyongyang. We could see, early, I think it was earlier this year mm -hmm. in january maybe the end of january there was like a five-day lockdown that was announced in pyongyang some people were out there saying that it was only isolated to the diplomatic community but mm. we could clearly see inside of satellite imagery an image taken at the same moment across the whole city yeah all the streets were empty uh. it was a lockdown so you can see stuff like that but as far as food uh, that's really tough to get it I, i'm there are some analyses out there about uh, crop health yeah. uh, using satellite imagery so that's another thing but also yeah, that's more of trends, uh, you know, the graph over time could look worse than before. And remind me, during the pandemic, the, the work, well, when North Korea was uh, actually having, you know, experiencing deaths due to COVID, were you seeing or were anyone, was anybody seeing mass burials or, or piles of uh, bodies wrapped up in sheets, that sort of thing? Was that something that was visible? 
No, that's not... During when, sorry? Uh, well, COVID, the worst of COVID in North Korea. No, I don't think that... I mean, I never saw anything like that proven in photos. I never saw any evidence of that. I don't, I'm not even sure if people were describing that in the sort of anonymous reporting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we're exactly a month away from the military parade to yeah. celebrate Victory Day on July 27th. Yeah. This is something also that you can keep an eye on through uh, satellite photography to see the preparations, the practices. Are you already seeing things a month out or is that too soon? Oh, yeah. So we, we, we noticed it, I think, last month or maybe yeah, more than a month ago. I think we saw it starting. So this is typical. A couple months ahead, at least, they start to gather at the training base in Pyongyang. Where is that? In southeastern Pyongyang, in Miram. Okay. Miram. And that's kind of a, a, scale, a full-scale copy of Kim Il-sung Square. Is that basically what it is? Yeah, exactly. The, the size of the, the concrete square. Not right. the, they don't have the replica buildings or anything. Ah. Yeah. So they start marching there in their formations. They start this goose-stepping... Which I found interesting. You know that Kim Jong Un stopped the really intense goose stepping oh, uh, in 2020. Money? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. actually got a little bit less intense. Anyway, I thought that was huh. interesting. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. so so they're practicing for that military parade. We saw them actually in a formation spelling out the number 70 and the word Chunsung, which means victory, yeah. and that that implies it's the July 27th Victory right. Day, where North Korea celebrates victory in the Korean War, which was, as we know, uh, an armistice agreement. So. There will be military parade. We already see evidence of vehicles in another special vehicle compound practicing for the parade, which means we should expect to see uh, missile launchers mm. and, and uh, perhaps ICBMs and those types of uh, weapons at the parade. So this is going to be a big one. Maybe the smaller tactical nukes that they've been talking about too, right? Well, they, I mean, those have showed up in a lot of ah. uh, parades as well. So uh, you were always on the lookout for something new. People were looking out for evidence of more ICBMs on their on their mobile launchers because that could be a sign of uh, production success and ability to manufacture beyond expectations. And then they did that in the February parade this year. And so, so this will be like the seventh military parade since 2020, I think. Wow. The one coming up next month. Now, do you think it'll actually be on the day, on the 27th, or do they normally do it a day beforehand and then film it and then show it on the 27th? No, the, it's it's always on the day, barring weather. So who knows what would happen if the weather was bad. But over the last, you know, at least since 2020, there haven't been any weather issues. So it's always been on the day itself. It's just a matter of whether it's at midnight right. on the day. And where, where if it's on midnight, if it's at midnight, for example, it could start kind of at like 10, 9 p.m. on the day before. And then it really, you know, Kim Jong-un will come out at the strike at midnight. And then it'll kick off like that. Or it could be the evening on the July 27th. But They've all been at night since 2020. So whether that's at midnight or at in the evening, it could be either one. And I guess certainly for July 27th, that makes sense. It'll be hot. It'll be muggy in the middle of the day. So I would, if I was doing a military parade, if I was goose stepping, I'd rather be doing it at 11 o'clock at night than at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one thing I've noticed over the last few years is these, these military parades used to be a big deal for North Korea watchers, uh, military watchers, and they've just become so frequent mm. that... I, it almost seems like okay there's the anticipation has dropped a little bit and sure show us if you're gonna you know maybe they'll show us something new and that'll be interesting but they've just been doing so much testing that you really wait for the demonstration of these missile systems right not just showing them in a parade so the parade is fun and interesting because it tells us what they're gonna what they're working on and then that can help with you know whoever is trying to be you know more prepared about the enemy but but yeah it's uh expectations for something groundbreaking and huge is is a little bit less right now do you think they'll have any chinese uh, vips maybe some war veterans yeah that's a good point so year. maybe it'll be a, an opportunity for something to change around the pandemic restrictions but right. for that as well we haven't seen any evidence of preparing to let in a bunch of guests for sure maybe okay so since 2020 i think there haven't been foreign guests even the diplomatic community, ah. even the Russian and Chinese ambassadors, they have not been attending these military parades. I suspect it has something to do with the secrecy, wanting to keep all photos of these events in house. Right. They haven't. There haven't been any external. And they used to have. You know, NK News went to parades in yeah. the past, and you're sitting there at the edge, taking any photo you want, zooming in on these weapon systems in the the parts they don't want you to. Maybe yeah. so. So yeah, maybe maybe we'll see the ambassadors at the event. Maybe we won't. All right. Well, let's wait and see. Thanks for coming on the show, Colin. Uh, stay tuned after this. We'll have my uh, interview with a survivor of the Korean War talking about his experiences. All right. Thanks so much. 
Ever wondered what lies beyond the inter-Korean border? NK News brings you an opportunity to explore North Korea from a near distance. From October 8th to 17, 2023, journey with us on the second ever North Korea from a distance tour, visiting key border locations and observatories looking into North Korea, as well as meeting key figures working on DPRK issues. Spend two nights on the East Coast, see the beautiful Kumgang Mountains, scour the beaches near the inter-Korean border, and see Kim Il-sung's old summer house. Visit Yonpyongdo, the location of the November 2010 inter-Korean artillery bombardment. Observe North Korean hamlets from close quarters in Kanghua and delve deep into the heart of Seoul, the capital of South Korea. Every step of the way, you'll be guided by leading NK News and Cordial Tour staff and be joined regularly for multi-day portions of the itinerary by leading experts like Andre Lankov, Chad O'Carroll, Jongmin Kim, Jacko Zwetsut, and Gergo Vachi of Cordial Tours. As a special offer for our podcast listeners, quote podcast when making your booking for an exclusive 10% discount. Find out more at nknews.org slash tour. Once again, that's nknews.org slash tour and use the, the code podcast when booking. Let's journey into the unknown together. Welcome back, listeners. Uh, for our longer interview this week, I am joined in the studio by Dr. Kim Gyeong Jin. Dr. Kim is a living witness to Korean history. He is a retired school and college teacher and lecturer and lives in Seoul. And he's here to share with us his memories of the Korean War, which started 73 years ago last Sunday. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Kim. You're welcome. So, uh, Dr. Kim, let's start with uh, where and in what year were you born? Uh, Changchun, Manchurian Empire, capital city, in 1936. Aha, uh-huh. and Changchun had a, a different name then, didn't it? Yeah, in Japanese, Shinkyo, Korean, Shingyong. Aha, uh-huh. and what do you remember uh, of, that, uh, of your childhood in Changchun or Shingyong? I just remember the church I went to school, the Yongnak Primary School, and some park. Kodama Goeng, that means Kodama Park. Yes. Some department store named, has a famous name, Mitsa, Minakai. Minakai. Ah, Minakai. Yeah, there was, one uh-huh. here, there was one here in Seoul also, the Minakai. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, you were born to a uh, Korean family uh-huh. who were living in Manchukuo, which was a Japanese puppet state. Right. And at home, you spoke the Korean language, right? And at school, you spoke the Japanese, Japanese language, uh-huh. and on the streets, you spoke the Chinese, Chinese language, right? So it was a very kind of multilingual yes. city. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and your father worked for the the Japanese uh, government, is that right? Office work, monopoly office. Ah, in the monopoly office, yes. so there were some kind of industries which were monopolies. Here in, uh-huh. in South Korea, tobacco used to be tobacco a monopoly. and salt. Yeah. Ah, tobacco and salt. So yeah. your father was working in that office. Yeah. Uh, that control the tobacco uh-huh. and salt. Uh-huh. Okay. And then in August 1945, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. And how did that change your life? Did you say August 15th? August 1945. August 1945, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. I think maybe August 8th. That's the end day of the last day of the world. Yeah, not August 15th. Uh, before that, so August oh, 8th before, or uh, August, uh, yeah, yes, before. earlier in August, yes. the Uni- Soviet Union declared war on Japan, uh-huh. and that changed your life. Uh-huh. Right. How did you notice that the war was approaching, that the Soviets were coming? Maybe my dad and broadcasting and maybe some newspaper. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. Did you see any uh, Russian soldiers? Not Russian soldiers, but uh, I heard yaks. The Yaks, the, the Soviet planes. Right. And they were Fighter plane. mm. flying over Changchun. Ch- Changchun, yeah. Uh, were they bombing already? That's just, I heard, not, I didn't hear st- in Changchun city, but I heard. Ah, you heard that they were coming. Yeah, uh, they, they were coming. Were, okay. Right. And how did you and your mother come to leave Manchuria and cross the border into Korea, to South Pyongando? In August 13th, by orders of government, they prepared train, a uh, retreat train for a few days, not for south, just for uh, just retreat from the dangerous place. Right. And a couple of days after, uh, we should 
they t- told me to come back. Ah, so it was a it was a temporary retreat. Right, temporary retreat. Right. Out of the uh, the war area. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And so you and your mother crossed on a train, crossed sure. the border, crossed the Yalu River. Yalu River into Korea. Into Korea and stopped at Chongju City, uh, maybe small town of Chongju. Yes. Was it your first time to Korea, or had you visited the north of Korea before? About a couple of times I visited in, during my vacation. Mm-hmm. Okay, and in fact, your father had uh, roots in South Hamgyong province, didn't he? Yes, my dad's hometown is Chongchu, uh, Hamgyong Namdo, Chong, Chongtong. Ah, yes. yes. And uh, where do you remember where you got off the train, and how long you stayed there uh, in northern Korea? Yeah, uh, stopped it. Chongju stayed, and one night we spent, and we got the train again. Ah, and, and head for south. For the south, okay. Yeah. And w- what was the reason for leaving the northern part and moving to the south? Oh, in Chongju, there's no uh, relatives. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, in Seoul, there are some relatives, and my mother's relatives, yes. And, and did you see your father again after that time? No, I have to... Uh, Departure of uh, Changchun Station, never again. Oh, that's very sad. Mm, that's yeah. a, that was the last, yes. Wow. Uh, and so you, you came to, uh, to Seoul. You had mother, your mother had relatives here in Seoul. She had family mm. connections here. What do you remember from that period after you first arrived in Seoul and before the Korean War started? Because Seoul was quite a chaotic place. There was a lot of political violence. Did you see any of that as a middle school boy? Oh, uh, at that time I was a primary school. A oh, primary school, boy, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah I s- sometime uh, the people gathered together, and uh, there are two groups. Huh? Uh, one groups, how can I say, right side or yeah. left side? Huh? Okay, okay, yes, yeah. Okay, right side, right side people are always uh, head for soul ground. That's uh, maybe that's now that's gone, but. Uh, the playground. Ah, yeah. Uh, well, near to Dongdaemun. Oh, is it the, the yeah, the Seoul racetrack or the Seoul training ground? Uh-huh, yeah. Right. And left us to Namsan. Namsan, uh-huh. right. Okay. And and your your house was in the north of Seoul, wasn't it? Mm, Donamdong, the uh, northern part of Seoul. Northern yeah. part of Seoul, uh-huh. yeah, in Donamdong. Okay, which is uh, mm. outside the old city wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Now, so you you were living there with just your mother, is that right? Right. Um, what was your mother doing? Was school she a, teacher. She was a school teacher. So now we move to 1950. It's the morning of Sunday, June 25th. Mm-hmm. And all along the 38th parallel, North Korean troops and armor are moving across the line, invading South Korea. How did you hear the news and where were you? And did you and your mother feel scared? Of course, yes. We heard uh, radios and... So in the newspapers, yes. Ah, so you probably heard it on the radio first. Uh huh. Yeah, and you were at home. Yes. And did you did you or your mother think we have to leave? No, almost. Uh, so like we were stay at, de- at on that day. Yeah. So most people stay. Most people stay at yeah. home. Uh-huh. They didn't leave Seoul. Uh huh. Right. And soon after that, you spotted some airplanes in the sky, and you recognized them as the Soviet Yak airplanes. Yeah, because I saw that. In Manchuria, uh, I remember. Yes. So these are the same planes that you saw in Manchuria. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. And we now know, of course, that Soviet pilots fought in the Korean War on uh-huh. the side of North Koreans. I see. Mm-hmm. At the time, did you think they must be Soviet pilots? I didn't know that. I d- At the time, uh-huh. you didn't know No, that. no, uh-huh, okay. I don't. Now, as the, the North Koreans advanced through Uijongbu and mm-hmm. they came down mm-hmm. to Seoul, yes. one of the last defenses was the Miyari Goge, right. or the Miyari Pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was near your house. Right. Did you see or hear any fighting? Oh, no. Before the night, I uh, went to one of the uh, royal palaces. Pal- palaces, yeah. Yeah, you went yeah. to the yeah, Changdok yeah, Palace. Yeah, so, so I can see it. Uh-huh. So you. You stayed one night, one insi- night inside yeah. the palace yes. uh, compa- complex. Right. Yes. The, yes. Not, not in the building of the palace, but in the rear garden of yeah, the palace. Yeah, rear right? garden. The, uh, the, the B1. What, what, what do you call this small... small uh, kind of a wooden pavilion? A pavilion, yes. right. right. <laughs> yes, so you pavilion. Stayed, you stayed under a pavilion. Yeah, under the pavilion, right. To hide from the fighting. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. 
Now, after that, of course, uh, all of Seoul was, was captured by yeah. North Koreans. So mm. how soon after Seoul was taken by North Korea did the North Korean soldiers come and visit you and your mother in your house? About uh, a week later. Yeah, yeah. About a week later. And, yeah. and what did they do when they visited? What, what did they say and what did they take? They came to the house and they looked around and uh, they found something and they picked them uh, like a camera or a some old, old days typewriter. Typewriter, yeah. 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 And uh, they told me uh, they need such things for their, their office or some unit. Right. Uh, so we're we going to uh, take these things. Then after a few days, yep. then somebody will come here and they give back, repay. Ah, they will repay the, you. Yeah, for, yeah. They will compensate you for those items. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they also found some other items, didn't they? They found some egg cups, some shiny yeah, yeah, metal yeah. egg cups. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell us the story about the egg cups. Oh, they, they say, what's this? Is, isn't it or something like a hand grenade? Or uh, oh, no. Because of the round no. shape. Yeah, they right. thought maybe it's a hand grenade. Yeah, yeah. We, we put egg in a yeah. kind of uh, egg holder, egg yeah. protector. Yeah. So they took. Yeah, so some things. Yeah. Were they were they valuable? Those egg cups? Of course, valuable. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, did this incident change your perception about North Korean soldiers? Uh, exactly. At first time, I really don't know so much about. Not so much. Mm-hmm. Mm. Now, um, when the North Koreans were in charge of Seoul, because for three months uh, the North yes. Koreans were uh-huh. uh, running the government of Seoul, they had mm. a new mayor mm. and they had new GU office chiefs mm. and, mm. and local mm. chiefs. Did mm. you see any political violence like uh, people's courts uh, in your neighborhood? Yeah, people, because I heard much, but I never saw directly. Yeah, I heard much. What yeah. did you hear about the people's courts? Well, some it took them. They ask people, is this man uh, right or left? Then, ah, this is not right. Then take him somewhere. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I don't know. Afterwards, maybe they shot. I don't know. Huh. So, so some people disappeared, but you don't know what happened to them? Oh, directly, no. I just heard. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, um, how did things change at the middle school that you attended? Uh, did you get new teachers at the school, and and what did they teach you? Uh, yeah, some of the ch- teachers are from somewhere, uh, but we never had listen like uh, our language or mathematics or such things. Just you, you didn't have every a day lesson. songs, uh, patriotic songs, and have all time propaganda meetings. And that's all. Did you have to wear a special uniform? No, just school uniform. Okay. So we all usually wear it. Yeah. D- can you sing one of the songs that you uh, learned at that time? For example, the song of General Kim Il Sung? Uh-huh. <laughs> Yes. Wow, and you still remember that yeah. seven, 73 years later, yeah, that, that song remember. is still in your head. Yeah, not only this song, I remember a little more um, natural anthem and some partisans. Yeah, they... So many toros singing. Yeah. Right. There was a lot of time singing, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you also uh, see the, the photo of, of Kim Il-sung or the painting of Kim Il-sung? Right, at that time? right. Many, yeah. many everywhere. Yes. And did you think, wh- what did you think about Kim Il-sung at that time? Well, I didn't know so much. Just, just mm, he's a, just a pretty good general. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he'd fight for uh, country. Yeah, uh, that's all. Uh, we 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 can search people in South too. I think right. Yeah. Mm. And uh, now you and your mother uh, were Christians, and and you mm. went to a church mm. at that time. Did the church continue the activities while the North Koreans were there? Oh, after that, I 
never got went to church. Ah, mm. okay. So that mm. ended with the mm. invasion from uh-huh, North Korea. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. And how did uh, well then uh, one day at your school at the middle school there was an announcement that all the boys aged 16 and older would go to a special place. Tell us about that announcement and about that assembly in downtown Seoul. Yeah. We gathered in the school ground and uh, we marched to Chongno Primary School. At that time, mm-hmm. it's now it's a Chongno District Office. Right, right the Chongno Guchong. Yeah. Guchong, yes. yes. It's very close to the American Embassy. Right. Just behind there, yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, how many uh, children, how many boys were there at that time for that meeting, that assembly? Why, many of them, not only uh, I was my school, yeah. every school, okay, maybe there was more than a thousand, I think. There was a lot of yeah, boys. Yeah, a lot of boys, yes. In, all in the school uniform. All in the school uniform, right. And, and who was speaking that day? Well, I don't remember the whole board. Yeah. Uh, what was the message? Just propaganda, and we must fight for the country and uh, unit, yeah, unify the country. Yeah. Right. That that kind of story. Yeah. And the older boys, they had to join the North Korean army, didn't they? Yeah, most of them. Yeah, they they have no what you call not uh, as his will. Yeah. They didn't have a choice. No choice. Right. No choice. Yeah. yeah no what choice. was the minimum age of those boys who had to join the North Korean army at that time? Minimum 16. Huh? 16. And how old were you at that time? 15. Okay, so you were just a little bit too young yes. to join Yeah, the I army. was second grade. Right. And yeah, so over third grade. Yeah. yeah. And I think some of your age group boys, they wanted to join the army early, didn't they? Not. They, one of the boys uh, stood on the stage. They say, Let's join we together also, the young boy also. Right. Yeah. But at the time, <laughs> I escaped you the escaped. place yeah, ah. and to the war. You jumped, jumped over, over the, over the wall. wall. And about, uh, I took about 30 of them. Some, and 30 of your, your, your friends from yeah, your school. Yeah. And after that, I never back to school. Wow, you never went back to the school again. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, now, I, I think uh, one of your cousins was a little bit older than you. Yes. And he had to join the North Korean army. Was it at that time? No, not at that time. Right. The other time, yeah. Uh-huh. And what happened to him? Oh, maybe some Pyongyang, uh, Pyongyang-do, he told me. Yeah. pyongyang and he worked at some... Um, a factory, ah. he told me, yes. So he was a, a wartime laborer in a factory. Right, yes. Yeah. And how long did he stay there? About a couple of months. He came back to Seoul just before the nine, uh, September 28th. Ah, before okay. D- before the, the yeah. recapture of uh-huh. Seoul, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, so ha- how did he leave the North Korean factory? Did they let just him go? ran away. He ran away, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he came back. Uh-huh. Now, I understand that at one point you decided it was a good idea to leave your home in, in Donamdong uh-huh. and travel around outside Seoul in uh-huh. Gyeonggi province uh-huh. looking for food. Uh, why yeah. was that? Well, in the city, uh, we can have food. We can find food. But in countryside, well, we can have some food there. And so we got some precious things like camera or something like that. Yeah. Or a watch. Ring, watch, right. Yeah. Then we changed for the food with two the, weeks. Yeah. With a farmer. So, right, right. Okay, so you went to a farmer, some uh-huh. farmers in Gyeonggi province, right. gave them a precious item, uh-huh, uh-huh. and you got the food in return. Yeah, until uh, October the 4th. Did your mother stay home all that time in Donamdong? Uh, yeah, my mother stayed at Donamdong because she was a school teacher, and he must have stayed home. Yes. How did she survive? Well, uh, that's not a uh, better place. So but it was not. What, was it difficult for her to get food for herself? Ah, uh, yes, it's difficult. For, yeah, difficult for food. But uh, yeah, very poorly he li- uh, lived. She somehow managed to scrape by. Yeah. And how did you hear the news about the September 15 Incheon landing? Well, uh, officially, no. Uh, such a news we we could hear, but somebody said with the 
a golden sound. The far, far golden sound. Yeah. Uh, they heard the, the sound of the guns far sound away. Sound of the guns yeah. far away. We could hear. There's someone explained that's the American UN uh, naval forces. Uh-huh. Yeah, gunfire. And so uh, after that, that was September 15th, and it? it took some time. So it was quite slow to move from the, the UN forces moved in from uh, Incheon to Seoul. When did you decide that it was safe to return to Seoul to find your mother? We didn't know exactly. So just we start uh, October the 4th. Oh, ah, yes. Yes. I headed for South. For Seoul. Yeah. Yeah. And when you tell us about that journey home, what did you see and what did you find when mm. you returned home to Donandong? You mean after? After October the 4th, uh, you, as you were walking back into Seoul, back to Donandong, oh, yeah. you saw oh, many uh, destroyed uh, buildings. But October the 4th? Yeah. Oh, October the 4th, uh, we didn't know Seoul was recaptured by. Korean and the UN forces, but just left and head for Seoul. Yeah. And that was the north, uh, north part of Uijongbu. Yeah, about hours walk from Uijongbu city. Oh, yes. Yeah. And when we arrived in uh, Yangju, we first saw uh, some North Koreans. Right, couple soldiers? Soldiers, yes, yeah, soldiers. Some with guns, but some, there are many soldiers without any rifles. Right. Uh, so head for north. Uh-huh. And after about five minutes after that, well, I suddenly saw uh, American soldiers, yeah. Uh, yeah, artillery right. soldiers, playing cards. Playing cards. Yeah, playing cards. But uh, when they, uh, we passed by them, yep. nobody pay any attention to us. It's a front line. Yeah, but w- they, nobody, just laughing and playing around. They were resting. Yeah, resting. Right. Okay, so you actually, you came back to Seoul from the north. Then. Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. through Uijongbu, Uijongbu. and Yangbu, yeah. Yangju. Yes. Uh, I heard that they Seoul was recaptured. Yeah. yeah, I heard that. And when you came back to your house in Doramdong, was your house damaged? Not damaged. Yeah, luckily. Very luckily, damaged. yeah. Yes. What about in the neighborhood? Was there damage in well, the neighborhood? Neighborhood also uh, neighbor damaged. Ah. The damaged area is not so uh, Donamdong area. It's yeah. uh, Yongsan area. Right. Uh, yeah. Or, or most of. And in middle part of the Seoul also be flat. Yeah, in the center of Seoul. Yeah. yeah. Did you see any dead or wounded soldiers? Oh, yeah. It was uh, act after October the fourth, uh-huh. but not not there was no dead bodies. Maybe they clear away. Oh, they clear them yeah. away. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, you you went back home uh, to Donamdong, and and did life go back to normal? Did you go back to school again in Donamdong in October or November? No, 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 no. no okay. You yeah. didn't go back to school. Uh, no, no, no. Almost no one went back to school. Uh-huh. Uh, it's not so uh, free before the war. Right. And you, you said that most people didn't leave Seoul at the beginning of the war. Yes. So ne- neighbor, neighbor. Most people stayed no, in stayed, their neighborhood. Yeah, stayed. Yeah. Uh, and then in the winter of 1950, 1951, there was a second invasion yeah, of Seoul, this uh, time uh, by the Chinese troops. Yes. And what happened then? Did you stay in Seoul that time? Not only me, most of Seoul, I all ran away. Ran away, <laughs> yeah. right? So where did you go? I went to Andong. Andong, that's Chongsang in Gyeongsang-do. Lam, Gyeongsang-bukdo, Gyeongsang-do, yeah, yeah. Yes. Somewhere near uh, near Daegu, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Did you go with your mother? No, M- mother got to stay here uh, because he's a school teacher, uh-huh. yeah. and it was too early to escape for my mother. It, it was uh, uh, December, early December. I ran to. Oh. Uh, yeah. You left in early December. Yeah, okay, early, yeah. yeah the, the the main invasion of Seoul, I think, was uh, January 4th, wasn't right, it? The January yeah, 4th, 4th retreat. Right, yeah. right. But you were already in Andong at that time. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. And why did you go to Andong? Because my uncle was there uh, as a railroad station master, yes. Ah, he was a station master. Uh-huh. Okay. So as a station master, he would have seen many American soldiers coming and going on the train lines, using the trains. Right, yeah. And, and yeah, moving yeah, north. yeah. yeah. 
M- me too. Uh, when I reached Andong, yes, uh, there were many uh, Marine soldiers just came from north. Oh, the the Marine soldiers. Yeah. Well, where where in the north had they come from? You know, uh, were they Ham Hamgyeongdo, very very far from Hamgyeongdo. They said most of they say. Hagory, Hagory. I I didn't know the meaning Hagory. It sounds like the, some other country's name, but yes. it was Korean town name, Hagorori. Yeah. Hagorori. Hagorori. Yeah. Ah. Right. Yeah. And was that uh, were they fighting at the Chosin Reservoir or the Changjinho? Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. So they I, were. I I heard that too. Yeah. Chang that they were retreating, retreating from, right. from the Changjinho. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And what condition were they in? Uh, they look very tired. Yeah. 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 Because it was cold and mm, yes, very cold. Actually, and, and your journey to Andong was cold too, wasn't it? Oh yes, yeah. Yes, Tell yes. us about the train from Seoul to oh, Andong. Tra- what was? What do you remember about that yeah, train? Yeah, we had uh, no passenger train. Uh, we rode cargo train. A cargo train, yeah, yeah. and unroofed. Unroofed. Yeah. Uh, so in the winter, and in winter, December, very cold. You're in a, yeah. in a train yeah. with no roof. Uh huh. Okay. Wow. And then. Uh, you, so you ended up in Andong, staying with your your uncle. Uh-huh. Did you say that your uncle was uh, was a musician? Did he make music for the Americans? Oh, not that musician. No? He just like play violin or something like that. Not musician. Your uncle played violin. Uh, not so good. Ah. Yeah, not so good. He tried to yeah. entertain the like, American like, soldiers. You know, uh, he liked to play uh, Christian hymnals. Ah. Like not like, play like plays good like this. Near my god to the right, yeah, yeah. so so it wasn't a very pleasant sound. No, no. no. <laughs> D- did the American soldiers ask him to stop? <laughs> no, 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 they, they uh, clapped their hands. Oh, good, oh, did they? Uh, okay. yeah. Now, how did you first come into contact with the American soldiers there? Oh, uh, accidentally, uh, I walked down the the street. Yes. Uh, uh, some Andong to uh, Yongju Road. Yep. And two military policemen walked. The dig that uh, I saw the uh, digging a hole. Right. And when I passed by, one of them said, Hey, boy, uh, where are you from? I said, uh, Where are from? Uh, I English no good. <laughs> uh, where are from? You from Andong? Are you live Andong? So now I live Andong. And where are you from? You from North Pyongyang? Oh, I from Seoul. Uh-huh. You? What are you? I'm a student. Yeah. Oh. You were still what, yeah. sixteen so, then? Yeah. yeah. So why didn't why didn't you go to school? Oh, here no school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I heard, I answered. <laughs> right. So, so they said, okay. Then you know. What this means, I, I they had a road the, sign. Your uh, road sign. Yeah. Then at the time, I had uh, uh, with my. Uh, you had a dictionary. Dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> dictionary, yeah. Uh, but it was not not a Korean English dictionary. It was a Japanese English dictionary. Uh, wasn't English it? Japanese dictionary. English Japanese yeah, dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, I can read uh, Japanese too. Yeah. Right. So I had that, and, and I saw the sign, and I uh, translate. Yeah. And they say, uh, can you read it in Korean? Yes. Uh, Shisok 50 mile. What does that mean? Uh, speed, speed limit uh, one hour. Yes. 50, 50 miles an hour. Uh, 50 miles an hour. Right. Yes. Then, can you write in Korean? I, I don't him. Okay. Can you uh, paint on the signboard? Uh-huh. Uh, I try. I try. Look good, yeah. Okay. So you were mm. translating road signs, yes, for the American military police, yeah, yeah. so that the Koreans could read the signs. Uh-huh. Wow! And you ended up working with the U.S. Army military police for mm. about a year. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Oh well, firstly, that's uh, I uh, had a nice food. Ah, they, g- they gave <laughs> yeah, you nice food, food. and uh, they also pay me to ah. paid me to yes. And uh, the life is very uh, happy. Yeah, it, after work, uh, we uh, get out in mess hall sometimes, and as uh, we sometimes sing a song. And some of them asked me to sing Japanese 
than Korean song. Mm. Yes, yeah. So I taught them some Korean song, Japanese song, and sometimes uh, on uh, another foreign songs too, like uh, Santa Lucia in Italian, ah. some uh, in German. Also, Jung und Morgenschen, such a, right. yeah, uh, songs, yes. Gosh. And were you living on the American oh, army right, base right, yes, with, with yes, the soldiers? Yes. Wow. And, and did they, they treated you well? Yes, very well, because I was so small. Ah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you followed them up from Andong to Seoul, didn't you? Right. It was a long journey. Yeah, though. yeah. They told me we are going to uh, head for north. Yes. And if the, if the front line... Uh, goes up. We also goes up, go okay. going up. So you you must join us and work together. Then it you can uh, have your you can find your mother afterwards. Right. Yes. And when you came to to Seoul or actually to uh, to Yongdungpo, right? Uh, what was your job uh, in Yongdungpo? What was your duty? Yeah, that that was uh, no more the road. The road sign making us stop. Okay. Uh, so the MP got to uh, work for check the people who people's papers who want to cross the Han River. Ah, uh, so every Korean civilian who uh -huh. wanted to cross the Han River, yeah, they had to show you, yeah, must their identity papers. Uh, not me, the uh, MP. Show the MPs. Yeah. But you were helping to read yeah, the identity yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And why Why was that? Why did they have to show their papers to cross the river? Oh, that's not officially uh, close to civilians. It's, uh, Seoul was not, how would I say, it's not far from maybe battlefield. I don't know. Ah, I see. So uh, Seoul was under military control. Yeah, right, right, under military control. Everybody who wanted to go into uh -huh, Seoul, uh -huh. they had to have permission uh -huh, from uh -huh. military, yeah. But uh, everybody can cross it with permission, the okay. paper, yeah. And then um, when and how did you uh, leave the U.S. Army and go back to your mother? Yeah, just after about a month, we came to Yongdongpo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a month after you came to Yongdongpo. Yeah, Yongdong. and yeah. I, the road sign uh, making was stopped and I had no, nothing to uh, do. You had no more work to uh, do. Uh, yeah. So I must, I, it's time for get back to school, I think. And I found my mother at the time, yeah. Was she still living at home? No, she escaped to Daejeon. No, no one stayed. Uh, oh, so I right. told you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. After I escaped, after that, she went to Daejeon. Daejeon. Also, there were some relatives in Daejeon, yes. Right. Mm. Uh, but in Seoul, you were reunited. Oh, I... Went back to Taejon, ah, where to Taejon. my uh, mother is was. Yes. Right. Okay. Mm. So you found your mother in Taejon. I found. Yeah. And right then there. together you went back up. Yeah. Uh, back Later, up to I, I we lived there uh, about a couple of years. Ah. Yeah. Then after that, uh, uh, before my mother, I, was, uh, I came to Seoul because. My school reopened. Ah, okay. Uh, and and so you actually you went back to school and continued learning uh, in school. Uh, was that the end of your involvement in the Korean War? Oh yes. Yeah. So um, I think you you were very lucky, very fortunate, you and your family that uh, yes, uh, your house was yeah. not destroyed, yeah. and, and you and your mother were not killed, uh -huh. and your right. cousins and other right. relatives also mm -hmm. so managed to survive. Mm -hmm. But. I see. Did, did you know any people who were not so lucky? Yeah, many. It was okay. I was very lucky with USMPs. N not only during wartime, after the wartime, too, I served uh, uh, choir members for the 8th Army Chapel Choir. Uh -huh. And after that, the Chapel Choir of American Air Force Chapel uh, for a singer. And after that, I became a, a director. Yeah. For a long time, about more than fifteen years. Yeah. Ah. I like so. I like uh, Uncle Sam. Yeah, you had, a, you had a, a long association with, yeah. uh, with the U.S. military. Yeah. Yes. Now, in July 1953, which is 70 years ago right. next month, mm. uh, the Korean War Armistice Agreement was signed, mm. and uh, 
course, as we know, South Korea's President Syngman Rhee, he didn't sign the armistice because he, he did mm-hmm. not want mm-hmm. to stop the mm-hmm. fighting. Right. He wanted to mm-hmm. keep going mm-hmm. until he defeated Kim Il-sung yes. and unified Korea mm-hmm. under mm-hmm. his own government. Mm-hmm. Many school children were organized to mm. march and, and mm. demonstrate against mm. the armistice. Yes. Did, did you also uh, join that? Yes, sometimes, yes. So you, you were saying, don't, don't stop the war, keep uh-huh. fighting, that uh-huh. sort of thing, yeah. Uh-huh. And then, but how did you really feel at the time? Did you and your mother feel we should keep fighting, or did you mm. feel it's mm. good that the war has stopped? Mm. As soon as we uh, take over them, uh, we win, as soon as... Uh, as long as, yeah, yeah, fight for the last, yeah. So you, you were feeling right. we should keep going. Yeah. Yes. Now, at that time in 1953, you still had some relatives on your father's side who were alive uh, yeah. in North Korea. Uh-huh. After, after the armistice was signed, uh-huh. after the war stopped, uh-huh. how did you feel about people in North Korea? Oh, of course, uh, pity on them, yeah. You, you had pity for them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You didn't see them as devils, but more like uh, brothers or people who are imprisoned, imprisoned in North Korea. How did you see them? Pardon? Uh, well, so later, after the war, yeah, uh, after the war. In, in South Korea, the, there was a teaching here. The ideology was that the North Koreans are devils with horns and tails. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But did, did you, uh, did, did that, were you also uh, believing that too? Of course, I am too old to believe that kind of right. word. Right. <laughs> Okay, so they didn't teach you mm. that at school. Uh, 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 but my relatives, uh, my father's relatives in yeah. North Korea, some of them came down. Oh, they did? Yeah, yeah. Some, uh, we met several times, but lost again. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> uh, they, they were living somewhere in the East Coast, ah. like Sokcho. Yep. Because Sokcho, still now, there are many uh, refugees from... Oh. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and then later, after the war, you did your own uh, military service as mm-hmm. a soldier in the South Korean mm-hmm. Army. Yes. Where did you serve? Uh, named Taegwangni. It's a near the front line. Oh, near the front line. Is that, yeah. in, is that in Kangwon province? No, Gyeonggi province. No, in Gyeonggi province. Yes. And were you ready to fight another war if necessary? Of course, yes. <laughs> uh, and now... Here we are, 70 years later, in 2023, uh, the armistice, uh, mm. it, it's 70th birthday, 70th anniversary yeah. of this year. Uh, of course, there have been many changes in North and in South mm. Korea. South mm. Korea is a democracy now. Mm. How do you feel about Korean unification now? Before I tell you that, the unification, the, what's the meaning of unification? Problem is, who ru- who role uh, who unified the uh, country? Which side? That's uh-huh. important. Yeah, unification, okay. But it, it, and that kind of unif- uh, unification, if South uh, Korea rules them, okay. But unification by North Korea, what, what's that meaning? Mm. So we, yeah, we don't want that kind of unification. So do you only want a unification where the South yeah. controls the Right, the right. <laughs> now, in South Korea, a lot of young people, they're not mm. very interested in, uh, in North Korea or unification these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, an opinion survey yeah, yeah. of South Korean people aged in their 20s and right, 30s right, right, right. revealed that 61% of them think that Korean unification is not absolutely necessary mm. and only 24% mm-hmm. thinks that it is necessary. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, fifth, if about some, I agree, because uh, it, we need much money. Huh? The youngsters mm-hmm. don't want to pay so much money <laughs> to them, right? But for you, do you think unification is necessary? Well, sometimes it's necessary, but I told you. Yeah, it which depends side. who's in yes, charge. Yes. Okay. Mm. Now there are still uh, twenty-eight thousand five hundred American soldiers here mm. in South Korea. Mm. Uh, what do you think? Are they necessary here? Of course, yes. As soon uh, as long as they stay in Korea, yeah, we enjoy free freedom. Uh, freedom, yes. yeah. And what's your hope for Korea's future? How can we find peace here on the Korean Peninsula? Ah, uh, well, the military military service uh, must be longer than now. Ah, uh, so now it's about. Uh, one year and a yeah, half, well, 18 months. How long were you in the army when you did your military service? As a 
SO uh, series, SO means it uh, stands for uh, uh, means uh, student soldier. Uh-huh. At, at the time, not now. At the time, I served a little shortly. Okay. Uh, one year and a half, eighteen months. Right. Yeah. Oh, so it's the same as now. I think it's shorter than that. Oh, I see. Maybe, you know, North Korean uh, became thirteen years. It's quite long. Yeah, it uh, was eleven, but they did again thirteen years. They drilled thirteen long years. How can the thirteen years and one year and some months yeah. and compare? So, in your opinion, uh, in order to keep peace on the Korean Peninsula, uh, we should have a, a strong military strong in South Korea right, right. with a long period of military, right, military service and it, uh, invent the new kind of weapons. Yes. Mm. Do you think South Korea should have a nuclear weapon? I think I like. You'd like to have <laughs> nuclear yeah, weapons, South yeah. Korea? Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for sharing your memories today on the NK News podcast, uh, Dr. Kim Gyeong Jin. It was very nice to talk to you. You are welcome, so I have a wonderful time with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Let me ask you this. You're listening to the NK News podcast, so you know more about North Korea than most. But how about the South? To really understand what's happening on the peninsula, you need to know about South Korea. And now you can through our new Korea Pro News and Analysis Service. This is not your average news service. It's a thoroughly researched analysis of South Korea's politics, society, and economy from an international perspective. But you know what the cherry on top is? The absolute lack of commercial influences. No ads, no sponsored articles. It's just pure, objective analysis by a team of qualified specialists. And the best part? As a listener of this podcast, you get a 25% discount. All you have to do is use the coupon code PODCAST during your sign-up. So head over to careerpro.org slash podcast and start your journey with Career Pro. That's careerpro.org slash podcast. Our thanks as always to Brian Betts and Arius Dare for facilitating this episode and to our post-recording producer genius Gabby Magnuson who cuts out all the extraneous noises, awkward silences, bodily functions and puts in the ads. Thank you very much for listening in next time.